Tonight on the Kiwi Football Fix, we reveal our KFF starting 11 for the Ferns at the World Cup. The three nicks times two ahead of a double header at home. We've also got the debut of our Spanish language department on location for Chile versus Haiti. And Manchester United wins the Energy Drink Cup. So good to have your company here on the Kiwi Football Fix. I'm sat alongside the top draw spoon, Jacob Spoonley, and Kirsty Yallop. <laughs> Explain yourself wearing a green and gold shirt. What is happening here? Well, I thought we were going to talk about the World Cup a little bit soon and my ties to Aussie, obviously. So I thought this is probably the only chance I'll get to wear an Aussie shirt in New Zealand and get away with it. Is it Tamika's shirt? Yeah, it's Tamika's shirt. And you thought it was OK showing up to the Kiwi Football Fix <laughs> in a Matilda shirt? Well, like I said, I thought it was my only opportunity <laughs> to wear the shirt in New Zealand today since we're going to talk about it. So. It'll never happen again, Kirsty. but it's so good to see you <laughs> after so long. I've been watching your Instagram photos and stories. I feel like we've just been spending, what, the last three months at the beach in Australia. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No, it's been so nice. We've had, it was, yeah, close to three months that we got to spend at home in Aussie and Meeks has been rehabbing her ankle. So we've got a lot of quality family time together and it was just awesome. We tried to make the most of it and, yeah, it was amazing over there and the summer was pretty nice, especially when we heard about all the horrible things happening yeah. back here. Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty ordinary back here. A lot of people still suffering uh, right throughout the North Island. Jacob, in his Technicolor dream coat, explain yourself. What are you wearing? Well, underneath is the uh, Beijing jacket, so from 2008, which seems a long time ago now. But the, uh, the punchline for this is don't sell all of your good ideas in the production meeting because Seamus Martin steals them <laughs> and goes on a week Sets earlier. You up, yeah. I think um, comparing the 2008 to the 2012 iterations, Seamus clearly wins, mate. That was a great cut last week. Mm. And I am wearing my all-white shirt in uh, memory of one of our great icons who's passed away uh, earlier this week. And uh, I suppose we can move into our onside, offside. I'm offside with the fact that we have to deal with the... Uh, the loss of a football icon like Grant Turner, but very much onside with the deeds that he produced on field. When you think about it, back to 1980 when he made his debut against Mexico in a 4-0 win, but it was really in 1981 that road to Spain, Jacob Spoonley, where he made his mark, scoring one of the greatest, if not the greatest, headed goal in an all-whites kit. Well, that was the chat this morning. Um, Unfortunately, Grant Turner has passed away. He has left us. And I think um, if we rewind a little bit, he also missed out on the 1982 reunion. So um, that chance to say goodbye to him wasn't there for everybody. But he's left us this wonderful memories. And I think you can look at Sumner's goal, Rufa's goal. But for me, this is potentially the best goal ever scored. How in has an all he done that, shirt. Jacob? How has he done that? He's so far out, he's generated the power and the accuracy like that. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about that. And I wasn't even born for it. But it got us through to the next round of qualifying. It knocked Australia out. So that goal is a huge moment in our um, footballing history. I think importantly, speaking to his value that he brought to our footballing community, Grant Turner, he is a man that you cannot write New Zealand's footballing history without. Yeah. So rest in peace, mate. Now, well said, Jacob. And, and Kirsty, he wasn't able to play in the 82 World Cup because of an ankle injury. It kept him out of the, the whole thing. But you just wonder, a player of that quality, if he had been able to showcase his skills on the grandest stage, where his career might have gone. Oh, yeah, there's endless opportunities for him. I mean, what a great header that was. And had he got to play at that World Cup, what what could his career could have been, like mm -hmm. overseas and abroad? It could have been, yeah, really wonderful and matched everything that he did just show. Yeah, our thoughts are with um, Grant Turner's family and friends at this time. All right, Kirsty, what's got you onside or offside with football over the last seven days? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just recently saw that... Wendy Renard, the French captain, she's just announced that she won't be playing at this year's FIFA Women's World Cup, which obviously is offside. I'm really disappointed about because she's one of the world's best players and best defenders in the game, arguably. So that's a massive loss, but I'm definitely onside with why she's doing it. And she's stepping away because the current conditions aren't good enough. And we're seeing more players following her footsteps from the French national team. So it's really interesting to see what's going to happen at the moment. Yeah, there are a lot of issues actually like that. And the French football, we spoke about Canadian football last week and the issues they're having with Canada soccer. How do you think it's all going to resolve? Yeah, I don't know. It's a tough one. There's, yeah, there's also the Spanish national team where 15 of their key players are not playing at the moment either. So... There's a lot going on in women's football and yeah, I think the federations need to start taking a look at themselves and seeing what they can do to better support their women's programs mm. and their teams and their players because 
you know, we, the best players need to be playing and they, they need them at the World Cup if they want to do really well. So, yeah, hopefully they can figure something out and start coming up with some solutions to making things better. Spoonley, onside, offside and why? Offside, but also onside. So offside, we're not the kitty kitty raw football fix, we're the Kiwi football fix. And I feel like <laughs> Seamus <laughs> okay. Martin has uh, hijacked the show and is um, giving ambassadors away left, right and centre. However, onside, I love the concept and I think we need to do something more with it. So I'm speaking to the Kiwi Football Fix audience. Give us an idea. Give us something that we can um, adorn our ambassadors with because we do have a lot of them, particularly in the football ferns. Nah, the Hamiltonians can come up with their own ideas. <laughs> don't need to help them out. I mean, Giving them a leg up like that, that's stupid. Got to be more than the hat that we saw Olivia Chance wearing. We've got to do something properly. We've got the World Cup coming <laughs> in a couple of months. Mm. All right, well, uh, myself and Spoon, we uh, actually had a, a wee mandate on Thursday last week. Thought we'd toddle off to North Harbour Stadium and watch the Ford Football Ferns up against Argentina. We had a couple of hamburgers. In fact, we shared a hot dog at one point as well. And uh, we decided, <laughs> look, we're not going to do any work. We'll make Christina Eddy do it for us. And so here's what she filed from North Harbour Stadium. Well, I'm hoping to see uh, the ferns take this one. It'll be good. If you can do your best, then that's all we can ask of you. So, yeah, give it your best. Yeah, we, we want to see them have a fun game, a good game. Yeah. Grace Wazinski. Yeah, Grace Wazinski. I want to be just like her when I grow up, and that I want to play for Wellington Phoenix for the club as well. We say in Argentina, I choose to believe. That's what we said when we were about to win the, the World Cup, the, the Men's World Cup. So we still choose to believe that we're going to get this one. Argentina! Yeah, I'm a big fan. I'm always watching football all the time. We're just going to have to keep pushing, keep pushing for sure. Like all that hard work, putting it in, on and off the field. The early cross swing in for Wilkinson, almost getting there. Good signs for the New Zealanders, and they are trying to be direct. Building nicely now for the Ferns. Cleverly got a piece of the football. Now this might turn in New Zealand's favour. Has it. It's one on one. Rennie. Wilkinson at the far post. Rennie tries to find a water ball. Oh, and it's just gone wide. Oh, that was a stunning counter attack. Charlie, great ball played in. Satchel couldn't control. Almost an own goal. Black stays down for now. Naylor comes. Naylor doesn't save. Naylor, what a save on the line. It's gone in. It's gone in. There is no flag. Foster drives it around the wall and it's clutched by Oliveros. What a match. Argentina treated this match and the New Zealanders with the utmost respect. Yeah, we, we stepped it up, of course. Um, it felt better out there today. Um, yeah, everyone tried their best. I think um, we had, had a lot. We had a few more opportunities, but um, it still just wasn't good enough. We need to get the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, I mean, we came into this tournament, you know, wanting to execute our game plan, and we didn't do that. We lost all three games, which um, isn't good enough. But the silver lining is, is that we got five months to kind of rectify things and come into our home World Cup a lot better. So what was meant to be a dry run for the World Cup later this year ended in not one, not two, but three defeats against Portugal and Argentina for our forward football ferns. Well, here at the KFF, we do really care about the ferns and their prospects for the World Cup. So the masterminds here at the KFF have come up with what we believe to be the ideal starting 11 for Yitka Kumkova in that July 20 opening fixture at Eden Park against Norway. Here it is, a formation. Yitka has trialled maybe two or three different formations, Jacob, uh, recently, but we're going with a 4-2-2-2. Explain a little bit more about our starting 11, please. Well, I think Jurgen Klopp said it best, and I'm reminded of his um, initial quote when he joined Liverpool. We need to change doubters into believers. And Wendy Sharp summarised it really well as well. To get out of the group, we need to score goals. So this team has been put together with goals in mind. Six in 18 games simply hasn't been good enough. Mm. So if we look at this team, where do goals come from? Of course, left-backs. Michaela Foster, uh, only a couple of caps in, but I think already across the A-League and her 90 minutes against Argentina, in particular, sorry, coming off the bench against Argentina, she looked fantastic. She changed the game from left back. She's a natural left footer uh, and having that has real value because we've played predominantly right footers there and Anton, Neville, uh, even Ali Riley is actually a right footed player. So it narrows the game. 
If you play Foster there, you then get to move Riley across to the right-hand side, move her onto her right foot. She is still the leader of this team. She needs to be involved in this 11. And if you free up that right-back position, CJ Bott, arguably our best player, our most dynamic player, um, she gets pushed further forward and she gets to use that physicality to add to what we've got with Jale and Clegg up front, which is a rather dynamic front line, in my opinion. So this is not a position that CJ um, isn't used to. She played against the Philippines and Mexico in this number 10 role, and I think having her further forward is going to be really important to getting more chances more regularly. All right, Kirsty, you've seen the team. What do you make of it, being a, a former centurion of this of the side? Yeah, no, I like it. I think, um, you know, everybody out there you know, it deserves a chance or, you know, is definitely a key player, so it should be out there. So I think it's a, a really positive-looking team and, like you said, got goals in mind. And I like the CJ being pu um, pushed forwards because she does get good crosses in and she's aggressive and she likes to play on the front foot. So I think we need more of that in the attacking third and I'd like to see more crosses from dangerous positions and not deep crosses like we seem to be seeing a lot of. And then, obviously, with Percival being back and, I mean, I guess Longo as well, she, hopefully mm. she can come back into the squad and slot in there. But those are some key players in midfield that we definitely need out there to control the game and control the tempo. Uh, yeah, and then I, I like the attacking options of Jale and Clegg. I think that's something we haven't seen yet and something we have, um, you know, Clegg hasn't been in the squad and we're hoping, you know, she will be given a chance. and. I think she deserves one. So, yeah, I like I like the I like the positive start. <laughs> how, how old were you when you were taken into the Ferns environment? Uh, I was 17 when I made my debut. So, so. let's get Clegg in there, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot of girls came in when maybe they were. I was 17, so I was a little bit older than the current girls that are still there, and then they came in at similar ages, 17, 18, some at 19. I think. I think Flea might have been 16, and a little longer. That is. So, yeah, definitely. Why not? 17s. It's fine to be in the fence mm. set up. And, and if she's comfortable and in there, then why not have her in there? I think one for me, I'm going to ask you, bring your footballing knowledge to the fore. Oh, wow. Um, Barry or Bunch? I mean, there's, a, there's an argument of consistency there. Claudia's been involved in this football fence backline for a long time. But Mackenzie Barry might add more of a physical element to the game. Yeah, I love the physicality that, that Barry brings. And uh, I, I, I personally feel like she's doing way too much at the Phoenix and it's because she's trying to make up for the inadequacies of the players around her but if you partner her alongside Rebecca Stott who's she's an exceptional talent and she's got lots of experience I think there she can just fo focus on what she needs to do in that role as opposed to making up for what people aren't doing around her and it's it's that physicality that I really like about Mackenzie Barry she's not afraid to throw her body around and make tackles and that's exactly what you want to see at the back, Kirsty. You know, like if you're if you're busting your hump further up the field and the ball goes down in your defensive third, you want to see someone like that making those those tackles to ensure that you get position back. Yeah, hundred percent. You want to see your centre backs, you know, smashing the strikers, stepping in at the right times, and she does those things. You know, she times it well. She always seems to be in the right place at the right time to make an intercept or make that challenge. And yeah, I think she would be really good alongside Study and. You know, hopefully that would, like you said, give her a chance to focus on her game more and not yeah. worry about the other things. Jacob, if um, worst case scenario were to occur and we don't have Percival and we don't have Longo, who sits in that, those deep midfield roles? Steinmetz for me, alongside yeah. Hassett. I think that combination worked really well. There's probably some people that feel like Malia didn't do enough at times with the ball, but I would say that's not her job. She's a disruptor. She wants to get the ball to players who can provide an attacking threat, and I think she was asked at times to do, um, or to play the game beyond her skill set. What I would like to say is that's our starting 11. Um, if you look at it, who we've got coming off the bench, Satchel, Wilkinson, India Page Riley, Bowen, Hand, and Collins potentially. So there are attacking threats that you can bring into the game from 60 minutes on. Yeah. Well, that's our team. I don't know what you think of it. And Yitka Klimkova, if you're out there watching, feel free to use it. Maybe in the next window. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, look, North Harbour Stadium wasn't exactly a happy hunting ground for our ferns. Would it be any different for the Wellington Phoenix women? They hosted Sydney FC at the weekend, their first ever outing at Albany. Walks into that corner. Oh, it's still there. Got to be cleared now by the Phoenix. Sydney FC looking to create something. It's been hooked in and there is the first goal. You know, we fought right until the very end and, and we gave it everything. We had chances that maybe should have been put away. You know, we conceded 
a goal that maybe was a little bit unlucky and we probably should not have conceded, but I think, you know, we put in a fight and we're going to keep doing that week in and week out. Sydney, if she get the win. We push for 90 minutes, but I think we just got to work on those defensive, like switching on in those moments and not conceding on set pieces. I think we should have finished some of our chances in the first half because we were creating, but yeah, it's disappointing, but um, it's an improvement from last year. We, we lost 3 0 and 5 0 last year, so yeah. Nice, beautiful little run there. Yeah, that Coming in from Wisniewski, and here's a top opportunity for Robertson. The flag is up, though. She's offside. No goal for the Phoenix, what a shame. I didn't know it was offside, but as soon as she blew the whistle, um, yeah, look, I just, I knew it was offside, so I couldn't do anything about it. You sit up, you prepare, you go again. Um, now, I don't want to make this about me, but um, I didn't used to get picked in teams when I was younger because I was fat. <laughs> I don't know why, I mean, I don't know why they think that. But what about you? Did you get ignored because you were too small sometimes, or they'd say that? Yeah, I even got a comment out there today, Mark the small person. <laughs> so you still hear it, um, but I think I, I learned to use it to my advantage. Robertson now! <laughs> now opportunity goes begging for Michaela Robertson. Kate. You're a midfielder now. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm happy to do any role that I can, and I know that we're disappointed not to have Betsy today, but it was a bit of fun and I enjoyed it, so. You did a little bit of a drag back sort of swish turn there. <laughs> what was going on there? It was all in the moment. Um, yeah, I think that's just, it uh, just kind of happened, and uh, yeah, I was just trying to do what I could to, you know, pass the ball and get the ball moving, as I know they're really good midfielders. <laughs> I know on the Football Fix we have um, ambassadors. You're from Canterbury, though, so could we have a ambassador? I guess, maybe? Yeah. I reckon we can make it work. Yeah. Now, Satchel, what can she do here? Paige Satchel. Satchel! Oh, there was no player following up there. A great run from Satchel. Sydney FC get the win. Just the one goal in this game. What is it about all these Tier 2 New Zealand towns that need ambassadors? Ambassador, Canbassador, what, what is the story there? I love it. We're going to mix it up. We're definitely creating chat at the moment. Positively or negatively, there's yeah, definitely chat there. Negative chat from uh, my point of view. Shall we <laughs> rip it to the three nicks for the uh, Wahinix? And we start with Kate Taylor, who, Kirsty, she's now a central defensive midfield player. What do you think of her in that advanced role? Um, yeah, I think she did a decent job there. I actually think, you know, she put her hand up to show that she can play that position. So she's got that versatility in her game and what she did well was you know stepping in disrupting play and playing on the front foot and get, getting the ball going forwards like this and yeah I think she did a good job so I don't know if it's her best position but it's definitely an option. Mm -hmm. When Kirsty and I were in Christchurch that tier two town that I spoke about earlier <laughs> apologies to everyone in Christchurch uh, Jacob uh, Yitka Klimkova was saying to me back then that she really rated Kate Taylor as a six. And then, lo and behold, we turn up at the weekend, she's in the stands watching Kate Taylor start. I think Kate Taylor has a wonderful confidence on the ball, which is great to have at the back, but it equally translates into midfield. And I think she's been allowed um, to take up that position because of Vandermeer and Barry at the back. They occupy those two centre-back roles, which is great. However, the question for me is, what happens this weekend? Betsy Hassett, who put on a performance for the Ferns and missed out through concussion protocols on the weekend, she's coming back in. Grace Wisniewski's there, and there's now Kate Taylor potentially in the mm. midfield. So how do you go two into three? It's a question for Natalie Lawrence. Yeah, sure is. Point two in the three nicks. Where's your Clegg at, at? We came up with a stupid chant at the weekend because we just love Millie Clegg. But where, where's your Clegg at? Is she out wide? Is she through the middle? <laughs> what do you do with this immense talent? I like her getting on the ball and I like her attacking from deep, bringing to bear that wonderful pace and directness that we've seen from her so far this A-League season. So I would keep her on the wing, but she definitely needs someone to combine with. At the moment, it seems to be Michaela Foster coming from deep but they need to balance it off with someone higher up the field. And she brings a polish to her game that we don't always see from other teammates. We saw there that Michaela Foster, wonderful run from deep, um, got through on goal, but the touch took her wide. With Millie Clegg, she's shown a determination to take that onto goal and the coolness to finish. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd like, yeah, I like to see her out there, but I'd like to see her linking with players. So whoever it is that is playing up top, I'd like them to get closer. I think at times the distance between the 
uh, Ava Pritchard and Emily Clegg and on the other side Michaela Robertson. I think it, there's just too big a distances and if they could get closer and combine a bit more we might be able to see Clegg getting in behind and using that pace and getting in on goal. Rather. Is that why the 4 2 2 2 potentially works in the Ferns that she can translate yeah, from maybe. into that position because she's playing She's off closer and there's someone else uh, yeah, in and, and on there but I'm not sure if that's if the uh, Phoenix have the players to play a 4-4-2 or not or what's best suited to them and the players they have. All right. Point three in the three, Knicks. It's Keeper's Corner. Over to you, Jacob Spoonley. <laughs> Bree Edwards. She um, pulled out some top draw saves in this one. She did, and she has done um, since she's been asked to step up and fill Lily Alfeld's shoes. And she's got a massive fan in Jason Pine. Jason was wondering why she didn't get any game time for the Ferns in the most recent window. What I would say is that there is a bit of fragility under the high ball. We saw that with the goal. Brianna should have cleared Michaela Foster out and the Sydney players and got rid of that ball. It then turned into a goal. So she's going through a period where she's adjusting to professional football um, and I think she probably needs to round out her game with being more confident under the high ball like we saw from Jada Wyman in the Sydney goal over the weekend. Has she ever picked your brains as to how to perform very, in very quick conversation, mate. Yeah. A, a professional environment because I was <laughs> I, I tried to pull her to one side and show her this clip, uh, which we always tend to show. Kirsty Actually, need we show to it see every week. Mate. Kirsty, have you seen this one? <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure I have seen this so, one, but I would I, like to see it again. Oh, thank you, Kirsty. That's brilliant. What I would say, <laughs> we're, we're not seeing Bree do this. <laughs> look at the difference in the field the from what it was like in the dark. weekend. It's a that's a goat track, mate, compared to the lush green grass that we saw in the weekend. Oh, what is happening with North Harbour Stadium as well? Uh, the the bomb that landed so that the Auckland Tuatara could play their baseball games there it's just ruined that grandstand, hasn't it? Yeah, the Tuatara baseball Godzilla have attacked North Harbour Stadium, mate. <laughs> that's what took it took a massive like. chunk out of it. <laughs> so yeah. weird. It's half the stands just. Yeah, Go but on. at least like if you wanted to play a night game there and the floodlights don't work, you can just drive your cars and turn your headlights on. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Hey, this weekend we've got the uh, the double header returning to Sky Stadium, and the women play Brisbane Raw. Now we should have won this game. Do you remember this one, Kirsty? Just a month ago, three three. Mickey Robertson, who loves a disallowed goal, it seems, yeah. she had the winner, and it was disallowed. So what are you expecting this weekend? Revenge? Yeah, I mean, hopefully it's definitely an opportunity for the Phoenix to get another win and on home soil. So hopefully they are going into the game with a lot of confidence from that last game, the three or draw, and yet. Yeah, when they could have won and had the disallowed should goal. Have won first yeah, time. <laughs> yeah, definitely should have won. So, um, yeah, I think they should be ready for this game. And Brisbane Raw are not in the best form at the moment. So, it's also, yeah, a big opportunity for the girls to go out there and hopefully get that three points this time. I think what we saw in the Brisbane game was the fight returned to the Wellington Phoenix. We saw the confidence to stay in the game, and we can expect that from them this weekend. We saw it over the weekend against Sydney, I think. Had they played Sydney earlier in the season, it would have been a completely different result. So this team seems to be building back into itself, which is wonderful to see. And hopefully we can see them pick up three points instead of one this weekend. Staying with black and yellow, the men's side, they finished their four-match tour of duty, if you like, of Australia up against the second-placed Central Coast Mariners. Take a look at the highlights. Silvera slung in towards McGarrick. First Mariners goal for James McGarrick. Stormer who comes back onto that left foot, has a look up, and his opposite pullback, McGarrick. Lovely touch and turn from Sass, and across is the dangerous one. It's Oscar Zabana surely. Off the line, incredible by Stormer. Malolo's been good in the air tonight. Great flick on Marco Tullio. Yeah, by Laws. In. Oh, it's a straight red card. Brian Kaltak sent off for the third time this season. Utterly extraordinary. It was a lunge for the ball. Room. They're queuing up. McGee! What a save, Oli Sale. That close might fall for Zavada. He comes around the back unguarded, puts himself in between the ball and the goal. As well. Oh, now Barash squaring up to Wooten. It's a booking for Wooten and it's a red for Barash. 
This game ending in chaos. Nick Montgomery sent to the stands. At this point, we might have nobody left on the Mariners team or bench. It just wouldn't be a Wellington Phoenix game in Australia without a little bit of niggle at the end and a few red cards now, would it? All right, let's rip into our three nicks for the men. And uh, Jacob Spoonley, a flat Phoenix yeah. in this final game on tour, which is weird given what we saw last week in Tasmania where they produced some of their best football. They were flying against West United last week. Um, but if you look at it, they've travelled to Gosford, they have travelled um, to west of Sydney in MacArthur, uh, they've travelled to Hobart to play West United and to Melbourne across uh, February. So they've done a huge amount of travelling. So you can understand there might be some fatigue in this Wellington Phoenix team. However, this also speaks to a season-long issue, which is that they only seem to pick up four or five points per 12. And there's only been one set of uh, four, uh, run of four games where they've picked up more than five points. So they don't back up necessarily particularly well. And I think it speaks to the mentality that they aren't quite ready to be a top two team yet or they haven't quite figured it out. Mm. Second point of the three next, we had some salty Mariners, didn't we? Uh, all those cards. And I suppose it was, it was almost set up by the fact as we watched Brian Kaltak's third red of the season. What a dirty player. I'm so glad the Knicks didn't sign him, oh. Jacob. But Kirsty, it was kind of set up by the fact that uh, Bojadar Krajev picks up a yellow card and that sets the bar relatively low, doesn't it? And then when Caltech does that, he's got to go. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's tough as a player. You would think he's got the ball and it's, yeah, it's an, a fair challenge. But I guess from a ref's point of view, he's looking at it at the fact that, you know, he's got a straight leg, he's off the ground and the studs are up. So... From if you're looking at textbook, yeah, it is a red card, but as a player, you'd be a bit, bit hard done. Yeah, by. a bit hard done. Yeah. yeah, I tend to agree with that. From a player's point of view, you can argue it, but the rules are the rules in this situation. But for me, the amount of Australians that text me saying, "Oh, that kind of offsets the Sydney referee," and I was like, "No, it doesn't." Mauritius knows exactly what he's doing. He's keeping his finger in Wooten's face, and then he goes for the eye. You can see at the end there, there's quite clearly a little prod. I thought he was going for a nostril. He's like <laughs> trying to fish out a nose goblin or something. It was so, all hey, up Scotty, in you've, been, you've been running around for 90 minutes. Just a little bit of a trickle. Let me just help you out there. But that's a completely justified red card. I don't understand what he's doing there. It's dumb. And then, just to add um, the je ne sais quoi, shall we say, Monty gets sent off for chirping. So, um, Which is what he always <laughs> does when he and Ufik Tele it's come up so against good. each other. We can see it from the commentary box when we were uh, commentating in Wellington. They just go back and forth. And um, not everyone's going to appreciate the energy, but I love it. I think it's great to see that confrontation on the sidelines as much as we see it on the field. And what about Oscar Zavada? He was, uh, well, it was an inauspicious start to his Knicks career, but man, has he come good. He has scored 10 goals, this with a Johnny Cage Mortal Kombat Karate kick, <laughs> to secure his 10th in 18 A-League games. He's actually the fourth fastest Knicks player in our club history to get to double digits, behind Nathan Burns, who took 11 games, Jeremy Brockie, who took 12, and Uli Davila. He uh, managed 15 games before 10 goals scored for the Wellington Phoenix. Where would we be without Oscar Zavada, Kirsty? Yeah, I mean, 10 goals already, that's pretty awesome. And that finished just then. I mean, a little bit slut in Ibrahimovic as well, you know, with the back heel. Just, yeah, I don't know, it was a great finish. And obviously he's, you know, delivering goals for the Phoenix and a real key player for them. I think, for me, it comes down to the 10s. How do we get the ball to Oscar Savada? Because he wants to score. He's someone that has found the back of the net with regularity so far this season. He's third on the golden boot list. Jamie McLaren's out in the front, 18 and 18 games, which is crazy. Uh, Jason Cummings, 12 goals, and then Oscar Zavada on 10. Um, so he's been a wonderful asset and, again, another great piece of recruitment from Ufuk Tale. Um, and then just finally, to make it, to put it even more into context, Goran, he was scoreless in the first five games. Mm. So he scored 10 goals in 13 games, plus an assist, which he could have finished, but he nodded it on to um, Krajev, who put it in the back of the net against MacArthur. So that is a wonderful return yeah. when you put it in that context. On the yeah. subject of goal spoon, how many goals did James McGarry score for the Phoenix when he was in black and yellow? Great stat. Um, uh, just stealing off Jason Pine. Zero and 40. So zero and 40 for James McGarry. Now, since he left the black and yellow, yes. how many goals has he scored against us? <laughs> two, and for two different clubs. Ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely insane. As far as James McGarry goes, he scored, obviously, for the Newcastle Jets at the, uh, well, it was like game two or game three of the season yep. started, and then at the weekend. 
Is he an option for Darren Baisley's All Whites? Well, if you look at it, I think Sam Sutton was the natural understudy to Livy Kakarcha. Um, but he hasn't been getting game time so far this season. Lucas Moragas is rather renting that position from him at the moment. And the other one that you could look at is Francis de Vries. Francis de Vries is coming back from an ACL injury, um, so he probably won't be available either. So it's up to him, really, is if, to, if or not he wants to put his hand up to take that position. Yeah, definitely. I feel like... Yeah, if he if he's willing to put his hand up and, and Darren Baisley's keen to look at him, he's definitely in with a chance this window coming up and yeah, you know, it's a opportunity for him to take that, you know, understudy position. And yeah, it's definitely an interesting one with the other players unavailable or injured or coming back from injury as well. Yeah, and this weekend is gonna be a another opportunity for Darren Baisley to cast his eye across a couple of right-back potentials. Callan Elliott will come back from his one-game suspension. On the other side of the field is Dane Ingham. It's almost like a, a shootout for that right-back spot. <laughs> yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, what a great situation for base to be in. You can see his full-backs going up against each other two and two weeks. So, mm. McGarry against Sutton on the weekend and then Ingham against uh, Callan Elliott. I think Callan Elliott's probably got his nose in front at the moment, though. Yeah, he sure does. He's been so good for the Knicks, and we definitely missed him up against the Mariners. All right, well, we move on to uh, what we've been experiencing over the last week or so, which is World Cup fever, the playoffs tournament. We had 10 teams trying to find three nations qualified for the World Cup later this year. And, uh, well, in one of the fixtures, it pitted Chile up against Haiti. And so it was a chance for us to debut our Spanish language department, which consists of one person and one person only. That's the KFF producer, Rodrigo Gomez. He went along to see his <laughs> brilliant Go on, show Roddy. lose to Haiti. <laughs> Sorry, Rodrigo. <laughs> Ha venido de muchas partes, así que han viajado acá a Oakland y agradecerle a todo ello y a la gente en Chile que nos ha apoyado. Así que gracias. Hi guys, we are here in North Harbor Stadium, getting ready for the match between Chile and Haiti. Only one will make it to the World Cup. Let's see what's going to happen. We took the day off to be here. <laughs> On Saturday here, Senegal and Haiti, Haiti was playing very good game, so our Haiti plays game again against Chile, so Haiti can, can win the game. This is my hope today as Asian. So these two teams into North Harbour Stadium side by side to level on the scoreboard and both with their dreams and hopes intact. Delivered by Lopez towards the near post. All it needed was a touch, and the touch goes just wide from Zamora. <laughs> Left uh, a little wanting and a wonderful hitter just over the bar from Keith. Flag is up. De Mornay. De Mornay into the area. Look at the power. What a goal! Melchi De Mornay. Oh, I'm from New Zealand, but we have a friend in Haiti, so we're here supporting them today. <laughs> In New Zealand. Juan Bazir couldn't get there. And is there enough of a pull on the shirt here? Juan Bazir. Strike save, Ingram. Cleared away off the line. One captain denies another captain. And Chile stay alive. Juan Bazir for De Mornay. De Mornay, the goal scorer. De Mornay scores the second. Surely Melchi De Mornay has played her nation into history. Hughes punches, doesn't get it. Zamora, they've got a lifeline. It is all over. Haiti have found football heaven and 
it's right here at North Harbour Stadium in Auckland, Tamaki Makoto. <laughs> Great work from Al Jefe, Rodrigo, for the Kiwi football fix. Must have been a bit sad, though, given that his Chile don't yeah. qualify. Haiti go through along with Portugal and the Panamaniacs. Kirsty, what can these three teams expect when they get to the big dance in July? Oh, I think it's going to be, you know, a bit tough because obviously they're the lower-ranked teams going into their groups. Uh, with Haiti, I think they're going to, they've got a really tough group with Denmark, China and England. So... The, yeah, those are all very tough games for them. However, I think they actually are quite a strong team. So I think they might cause, you know, some problems for those teams. And, yeah, anything could happen, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be a tough run for them. And then, yeah, Portugal's got USA and Netherlands. So two of the big hits. I mean, it's going to be a tough all round. Mm. I think what we got there was a, a taste of what the World Cup's going to give us. I mean, we've... You saw the breadth of those that come out of our communities to celebrate these sorts of moments. And there's a party atmosphere. I mean... Rugby and cricket won't give us that bandwidth, and it's fantastic to see. Unfortunately, there's the feeling in there as well. So we saw the heartbreak on the Chilean mm. side, but also the absolute ecstasy from Haiti. And we're going to have that multiple times over uh, in the coming months, which is great. I can't yeah. wait for it. Yeah, it's going to be exceptional. Last week, obviously, we were thirsting for the World Cup as well. And so in that, we spoke to Seamus Martin, Maya Jackman, and got them to pick their winner for the tournament, the surprise package, and a player to watch. And I'll ask the same of you two. Jacob, kick us off, mate. Who do you reckon is going to win? Who's the surprise package player to watch? Look, Canada and the USA are really, really strong, but I don't think you can go beyond the UEFA champions in England. So I think they're going to win. The surprise package, I'm a little bit torn. I think Spain are flying under the radar at the moment, particularly as the Matildas um, took them to pieces uh, in Australia in the last window. And I actually think the Matildas as well could surprise. Tony Gustafsson seems to be getting the wheels turning with that squad, and they are so dangerous going forward, building everything off Sam Kerr. So I'm going to say the Matildas... Haven't given you so much grief for showing up that <laughs> shit. And then the player to watch, I think going internationally, Rose Lavelle lit up Sky Stadium. You're a man after my own heart. And yeah. um, I think for the Ferns, Grace Jale. I think she's got the physicality, she's got the strength. I'm really keen to see what she does because every time she's put the Fern shirt on, she's shown so much promise. And I think she's just a spark away at the moment. Kirsty, you've been to two World Cups, so you're. Assertions are probably better than all of ours combined. <laughs> uh, what do you say? Um, yeah, I think it's tough. You know, I, I agree with Jake. Like, England, they're the European champions at the moment and probably one of the most informed international teams at the moment. So I think they're definitely challenges up there. I also think Aussie on home soil, I think they have... A little a bit biased, though. Huh? <laughs> a little bit one biased. One of Ali's mums. <laughs> yeah, one of Ali's mums. <laughs> one team I'll be supporting. But, no, I do. I think they have a massive fan base and when they play home games, they just seem to deliver and they mm. are always winning and they've just come off the back of three home wins and, yeah, and then... Um, I'll roll on to Sam soon. But I also think Sweden is a team that could take it out. They're a team that's always up in the top three and they always make it to the semi-finals or the final. And they haven't uh, taken one out in, the, in recent years, won it. So I actually think they could be a team that... Are they a tournament team, are they? Yeah, they're a tournament team. And I think they could take this one out. I don't think America's going to do it this time round. So I'm going to put that one out there wow, as well. Okay. I, I really just, like yeah, it. I'm doing it. I don't think, I don't think it's this, this year is their year. But, hey, you never know they... They're a winning team and they often do show up. But, yeah, Sam Kerr is going to be my player to watch, I think. The home tournament for her and Aussie. And just she's the best striker in the world and she just scores goals and she knows how to deliver under pressure. So mm -hmm. she's definitely a player to watch and so exciting to watch. Yeah, it can't be Team USA's year because isn't it the Warriors' year? In the NRL? Well, that's what we're led to believe anyway before the season begins. That's every year, though. That's every year. You can't yeah, say that every year. year. Uh, Kirsty, <laughs> uh, as we lead towards this World Cup, you must be pretty excited about it. And uh, I suppose it brings back memories of the times that you went. You were a, a two time World Cup attendee. What were some of your highlights having represented the nation and uh, gone to the big dance? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of highlights, obviously, when you go to your first World Cup, just, just the whole experience of everything and, and seeing how massive football really is around the world and, and how much support the game gets. And, yeah, that's just such an eye-opening experience as a player and, and as a fan as well. Like, it's just amazing. But, yeah, on, on the pitch, I guess, for me, would have been when we got our first point at the World Cup in 2011, when we drew against Mexico 2-all. 
uh, that you know that was a big moment for us as a team because we hadn't we weren't expected to do anything at the World Cup and we hadn't got a point or you know anything up until that point in time. So for us, we were really excited to actually get a point and we came from behind. We were losing 2-0, so to come back and draw to all was um, pretty special for us at that time. And how does having the World Cup at home elevate those feelings? Obviously, you're not involved this time, but you've seen the Ferns playing at home. You've been to the World Cup. The combination of those two things must be exciting. Oh, yeah, so exciting. I mean, it'd be amazing to still be playing and be out there with the girls and just getting to play in, in, at home in front of your friends and family and all the fans. Like, we didn't get to play many games at home while I was playing. So, you know, each time we did, it was really special. But to actually do that at a World Cup, is going to be amazing for these players and it's yeah it's a once in a lifetime opportunity just drive them forward on those last five minutes yeah mate. just extra people backing them and knowing that you know the people in the stands are behind them and it's just that extra bit of support hopefully can lift the girls up and they can do it correct me if i'm wrong but did both of your world cups play out in pretty much identical circumstances the first world cup you were an unused substitute in game one and two you come off the bench, Hannah Wilkinson scores the game levelling goal. And that happened again four years later for you. Yep. Unused substitute in games one and two. <laughs> You're off the bench, Hannah Wilkinson scores the game levelling goal. Is that not the weirdest thing ever? Do we need to get you back into the first <laughs> squad for the upcoming World Cup? <laughs> Just to ensure we get a point out of that of last a random game. random stat, but yeah. <laughs> is that how, is that how it played out? Because I was doing some research, I do research occasionally, mm. and um, that's what I came up with. Yeah, no, uh, the game against Mexico, yeah, I came on, I think, around the 60th minute and uh, yeah, I took the corner that Bex headed in for the first goal and then yeah, and then I was right there with Wilkie as she scored the second one. So I was you know, hoping that just in case she didn't get it, you know, I was there, but yeah, maybe. Who's got Yika's number? We, we, need to, we need to tell her of this phenomenon. I think <laughs> Seamus has her number. He's pretty close with her. Yeah. Uh, when she came to the studio that time, he gave her a smooch. That's interesting, yeah. mate, yeah. Is that the um, conduct of a ambassador? I'm not sure. Probably is. Uh, look, while our ferns... Well, let's move on from Seamus <laughs> pashing up the uh, national team coach. Not that he did that. <laughs> oh it was just God. a wee peck on the cheek. It was just a, a peck on the cheek. Don't read anything more into that. <laughs> but while the F Ford football ferns are gearing up for a World Cup later this year, get your head out of your hands, Jacob Spoonley. Uh, oh, debacle. <laughs> in, in the UK, uh, we've already seen some silverware handed out to Manchester United in the Carabao Cup. Yes, their first silverware in six years as they faced off against Newcastle United, complete with Lloris Carius and his brown gloves in goal. Opportunity for Big Dan Byrne. Casemiro now an opportunity perhaps for Veghorst. Rashford's arriving. He'll go for it. And a helping hand from Carius. Quite expensive those, you know. Well, they're almost inviting Murphy to shoot. And David De Gea was just hoping and praying there. Yeah, huge congratulations to Manchester United for their entry-level <laughs> cup win, the Carabao Cup. Well, it is, yes. it's the bottom of the heap, right? Isn't it? It's only really important to the fans that win it, right? They get to trumpet early on in the season that they've got a piece of silverware. Glad I've got some support on the couch. Yeah. Thanks, Spoon. Appreciate that. Uh, look, how important was Casemiro in this one? Because he was everywhere. 
Yeah. He was. He was sensational. I think he was the difference between Newcastle and Man United on the day. He was pulling all the strings. Um, we've heard pundits over the world trumpet how good he was. And I think if you expand that, he's probably the difference between Manchester United and Chelsea and Liverpool at the moment. And you're seeing the absence of that genuinely world-class midfielder in both Chelsea and Liverpool. So Manchester United can feel uh, that they've got an instrumental piece there and I'd just like to say yeah it's not a big piece of silverware but Den Haag is starting to worry me a little bit he's really turned Manchester United around in really difficult circumstances got rid of Ronaldo managed to get Dead Casemiro, managed to get Casemiro across the line and he seems to have Manchester United up and running and the fact that Sir Alex Ferguson is having dinner with them that's a pretty good <laughs> that's compliment a good that's, a, that's a good compliment yeah, yeah. yeah. Kirsty when they um, hand out the trophy though uh, Fernandez is there and Harry Maguire takes it. That, he, he's a bit part player for Man U. And there he is, stood there with the trophy. It just left me feeling a little bit, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't like it. You didn't like it? No. Nah. Nah, I mean, obviously, maybe he's, I don't know, to be honest, he could be quite an important player off the, you know, off the field. And, maybe. And a big part of the squad, I don't know. I think that was an intentional from Den Haag. I think he was saying, this is a player that's come through a really rough time, being blamed for a lot of Man United's um, deficiencies. Get him up there, get him front and centre as we lift the trophy so the fans get him behind him. And that was the key thing after the game. You could see there was an intention to align the fans and the team. We love our football fashion on the Kiwi Football Fix. And we also love our goalkeepers, which is why Jacob Spoonley is here. Jacob, you are the perfect man to have on the couch at this point in time. What did you make of Larice Carrius in goal for Newcastle and his brown driving gloves? Well, I feel like Carrius owes me something after the Champions League final. And then to oh, put you him... Both put him in his brown gloves, which is a voluntary act. No. Nah. <laughs> brown gloves are only for driving the Jag on a Sunday, Kirsty. Yeah, I've never seen brown gloves on a goalkeeper before. It's pretty random, but obviously it's... Firm no. Firm <laughs> no. OK, so you wouldn't see brown gloves on Jacob Spoonley. <laughs> but what you would see in the EPL is an overturned red card. I was watching Chelsea and Tottenham Hotspur at the weekend in the wee small hours of, what was it, Sunday morning? Ziyech appears to get quite heavily involved in this stoush here, receives a red card, Jacob, then VAR gets involved, and it's overturned. Now, earlier in the show, we saw Maresh waggling his finger in the face of Scott Wooten, and he got a red card. So why was Ziyech's red card overturned in this instance? Because I don't think he agitated in the same way that Maresh did. He didn't, definitely didn't get in the face of Richarlison. I'm actually OK with that decision, because Ziyech oh. just stands his ground. My issue with that is that VAR should have been in the ear of the referee and said, um, hey, we might, you know, don't get the red card out just yet. And the referee then needs to speak to VAR and says, here's what I saw. And VAR um, can respond and say, well, we didn't see that. Go to the monitor, have a look. And that way you make it a two to three minute decision as opposed to eight minutes, which is what I thought, I understand it took that long to make the decision. So that for me is an issue with VAR in the process. And the more important point is that they should take over the broadcast at that point. I feel like a broken record. But we need to hear the decision-making process as well as the decision. Yeah. Do you have a Premier League team that you support? Uh, not currently. I, I was always an Arsenal supporter as I grew up. But at the oh, moment... Oh, convenient. It just dipped out at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> back up well, you can get back in at the top level. <laughs> yeah, well, which is perfect. But, no, as a, as a kid growing up, I always followed Arsenal. So I'd probably have to stick with them now, especially now that they're doing well. But... Back on the bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we have just a little bit of a moan, Jacob, about Liverpool? Because they drew yeah. nil-nil with Crystal Palace. Always got space. That right-side defence was just cactus again. Oh... I like the new word, cactus, it's good. Um, yeah, they were inept going forward. This is a Crystal Palace team that was there for the taking. Nil or draw, chances very hard to come by. Yes, there's been injuries over the course of the season, but they need, I'm going to just say it again, they need Jude Bellingham. They need a game changer in midfield, and they haven't got that at the moment. It's going to be a, a prayer for them to get into the Champions League yep. spot. Yep, got to get him on the blower and get him signed up for next season. All right, we won't talk anything about Chris Wood because we don't want to relive that nightmare against West Ham United. But what other Kiwis are doing around the world? Are they flying, Jacob Spoonley? Well, they are at the moment, it seems. Joe Bell came up with a 1-0 win this morning against Meishlin, which is a massive uh, fixture in the Danish Superliga. Uh, Bronby have moved into the top six, which is awesome. Good. Max Mutter got a hat-trick um, for Sligo Rovers. A metric. A metric, I like that. Uh, and then Matt Garbert finally got a debut for NAC Breda, and they actually went on to win 3-2. Sarpreet Singh, not as lucky, 
but he came up with a delightful curling effort which hit the crossbar. So it looks like Kiwis are contributing all across the map. Logan Rogerson um, scored for FC Haka, and for anyone wanting to keep an eye out for it, Max Mata, uh, Max Mata, sorry, Max Crocombe is in the fifth round of the FA Cup against Southampton for Grimsby Town. So get up nice and early to watch that. One from the Keepers Union, of one course. Union. Spooner getting, getting him behind him. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? And then the next one is the MLS, mate. We saw the MLS kick off over the weekend, and that was huge. And I say huge because the crowds are really starting to build. How many were at um, Charlotte? Well, Bill Toy Loma moved across from Portland to Charlotte because yeah. of a really unfortunate situation. I think it's Welks, uh, their central defender, passed away through a boating accident in the off-season. So Bill's gone in to fill those shoes. He then finds himself debuting and being really influential, a couple of key clearances in front of 69,000 people. Wow. So that's the highest um, attendance in the MLS in the opening weekend. Only just bettered uh, Atlanta United, who got 67,000. They're actually in the top five most attended teams across the world. So the MLS seems to be coming of age. And then one of our KFF favourites, Michael Boxall, 1-0 win, away at FC Dallas. Um, great start to the season from Minnesota United. Um, do we need to talk about Bill Tuiloma's efforts in the concession of that goal? Where they lost 1-0 and he was there and he was sliding on the ground, tried to get the leg out, wasn't yeah. able to clear and then... It's a good point, well, but if you, watch the the build up, if you watch the build-up, he's driving the line forward. His right back actually has been lazy in the last I minute. like it, past the buck. Now, keeps him on side, and Bill's looking over the shoulder, sees him there, has to sprint back in as that ball's coming, gets his toe in front of it, and then his goalkeeper's been at the near post. So, yeah, Bill probably steals the highlights, but you can spread the brain across those three players. Kirsty, when you've been like solely responsible for something like a massive muck-up, have you passed the buck as well onto your teammates? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I couldn't really. All the groundsmen. All the groundsmen. <laughs> the <first>. grounds. <laughs> yeah, all the groundsmen. Probably more the groundsmen. I don't know if I could remember a circumstance like that or a situation like that happening. But and therein lies the difference between our two careers. Oh, Kirsty wouldn't have made a muck up like that, right? <laughs> Not saying I never mucked up. That's <laughs> but no, I'm just saying. Yeah, you definitely. You know, it's a whole team effort. So you want your team to be. You know, everyone doing their piece and doing their job. But. Yeah, at the end of the day, only some people get on the highlights for those unfortunate situations <laughs> and, and others don't. But, yeah, yeah it's a tough one. <laughs> My thanks to a couple of the best. Jacob, the top draw, Spoonley, and Kirsty Yallop. Great to see you back in New Zealand, even if you are wearing that Matilda's shirt. And speaking of the best, we leave you with the best of the best. Earlier this week, it was the best FIFA football awards. We leave you with that, and we'll see you next time right here on the Kiwi Football Fix. Marcin Oleksky. Women's World 11. Men's World 11. The best of the world, Alexia Puteas. The best player of the world, Leo Messi, campeón del mundo, Argentina. Felicidades.